Well, uh, one of the things that me and my, little, my girls, I say little girls, they're seventh and fourth grade now, but I still think of them as little girls. Things we like to do sometimes when nobody's around and nobody can judge us is we'll watch wrestling on TV and uh, professional wrestling. And we just, they like it and it's kind of fun. And, uh, and John David has seen it a few times now. And so he really, he really likes it now. And uh, in fact, I'll wake up in the uh, morning or whatever and, and he'll ask instead of, asking this to watch uh, Peppa Pig or uh, some kind of little kid show, he wants to watch wrestling. So we've been watching a lot lately, more than I even want to, because and there's actually a lot on there. So I keep recording all these because he wants to watch it and he watches it. And, and so what do you think he's been doing lately? He's been jumping up on the top of the couch and dropping the elbows and, <laughs> and jumping off the bed and uh, everything like that. And it's kind of fun. And and uh, you know, he's, he's just, he's wrestling. I'm, I'm just sitting on the couch. Next thing I know, he jumps on my back, you know, and, and I have to teach him. Okay, so what they're doing, they're in a wrestling match, but you can't hit people in the house, all right? So, like, that's an actual match, but you really can't do that here. So I'm trying to explain to him how that that's a different thing than, than real life, right? Uh, but a lot of times he likes me to pick him up and just kind of throw him around and everything and, and you know, just do all kind of crazy, which is fun. I, you know, I enjoy it. Uh, but, but he trusts that I'm not <laughs> going to hurt him. He understands it's playtime. He trusts I'm not going to drop him on his head. When I pick him up by his feet and do like this, I'm not going to drop him, right? Uh, he knows that because I'm his father, and he laughs, and he's having a good time, and, and, he, and he trusts me to not hurt him. Today we're talking about trusting God in the little things of life. Trusting God in the little things of life, much like John David's father is not going to intentionally injure him. We have a father who will not as well. And many times he has a plan for us that maybe we don't quite see, maybe we don't quite understand. And so we're talking about that today as we start a new sermon series on the life of David. We're picking up where David makes his, his uh, first appearance here in 1 Samuel 16, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. And Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice, verse 6. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Father in heaven, as we continue to worship today, we pause to look at this passage of scripture 
or that you have given us that shows the first step, really, the first appearance of, of King David, one of the, the greatest people in the Bible. People, Lord, a man, Lord, that you have said is a man after your own heart. So as we look at this story, show us uh, some principles we can glean by it about how you are and, and how we should trust you in our lives, Lord, even in the little things in life. Father, I pray that you're uh, with me today, that you speak through me, that you fill me with your spirit, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you today three circumstances, three circumstances in which you can trust God even in the little things of life. Three circumstances in which you can trust God even in the little things of life. Number one, trust God when he changes your plans. Trust God when he changes your plans. Verse 1 says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Now, a good portion of the first half of the book of 1 Samuel, which is, you see, we're, we're jumping here in chapter 16, a good portion of it deals with the people wanting a king, asking and begging for a king, God giving them a king, God giving them Saul, and then Saul failing as that king. It also deals with a man named Samuel, who was the last judge of Israel. It was during Samuel's time as judge that the people started to demand a king. Well, why, why would they demand a king? We had this judgeship working whenever they needed a judge God would rise up with one well mainly they say that they wanted a king so they could be seen as a legitimate country legitimate power among the nations because all the other nations had kings so why don't we have a king even though God was their king they wanted a human person a human representative look at first Samuel 8 starting in verse 1 says this when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after a game. They took bribes and perverted justice. This is just comes to show you that you can't control your children. Amen. <laughs> that might have been too many amens that time. I don't know can't control your children you can lead them in the right way but it, you know here was Samuel who obeyed the Lord but his sons did not they 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 turned aside after a gain they took bribes and perverted justice they were in the ministry so to speak for their own reasons taking advantage of kind of their situation in life verse 4 then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him behold you were old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Listen, we, we, we trust you, but your sons are judging. You're too old to judge. They're not following the Lord. They're not walking in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. So Samuel went and prayed about this to the Lord. And God told him, he said, Samuel, the people aren't rejecting you. They're rejecting me. They're rejecting God. Samuel then warned the people about all the negative aspects of having a king. He said, he's going to do all these negative things. He's going to take your sons and put them into battle. He's going, to, he's going to tax you. He's going to do all these things that you're not going to like. But they still begged the Lord to grant their wish, even though it was against God's will. Samuel then became a part of the, of the search process. That anointed Saul as king. Look at 1 Samuel 9. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bechareth, son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. Now, the reason there's so many son ofs written there is because all these men were prominent people. So Saul could, could trace his lineage back to five or six people that they knew. This was a, a very good family, very good reputation a man of wealth. These were men who were known in the community. And so they, they went to this man of Benjamin, verse 2, and he had a son whose name was Saul, 
a handsome young man. Now, if you're going to choose a king, you go to this great, respectable family, and you find this, 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 this nice-looking, tall, powerful young man. Right? So he was handsome. And there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. Okay? No, I, I guess it was just, like, I don't know if they polled everybody or something or what, but this was, it was understood he was the most, the best looking guy. And not only was he the best looking guy, from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. He was the tallest, the best looking. You know, he probably was the, the, the captain of the football team, those kind of things, if you know what I mean. So they choose Saul. He had everything wealthy, good looking, tall, dark. Handsome. This is kind of a, a lot of ladies' wish list for a husband, right? Probably had a full head of hair, too. <laughs> he had everything. Everything I don't have. He had it all, right? Tall, anyhow. So Saul becomes king. And has, then it has immediate military success. Just his first battle, they go and win. And I think this is great. The people loved him, and, and Samuel basically retires. At this point, Saul then had another military victory over the Philistines, which is like, kind of like their arch rivals. It's like Clemson, Carolina or something like that. Man, if you can beat the Philistines, we will love you forever, right? And, they, and he had a victory over the Philistines. And, and they celebrated his victory. But then the, the Philistines actually fought back. And Saul wasn't sure what to do about that. And the people became scared. And so Saul was kind of on his heels. And he decided that they needed to worship the Lord. Which is a great thing to think about. We need to go to the Lord and worship him because our enemies are on us. But there wasn't a priest around. The priests were the ones that had to do the sacrifices. Samuel wasn't around to ask advice. So Saul offered the sacrifices himself, which is a big no-no. Saul was the king. He wasn't a priest. Even he could not do that kind of thing. And and when Samuel hears about it, 1 Samuel 13, Samuel says this. What have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Saul acted in fear. As many times we disobey God when we're fearful. He acted in fear and he disobeyed God. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be a prince over his people because you've not kept what the Lord commanded you. We're going to see that the Lord was a forgiving God. Many things David did that were wrong, that God didn't take the kingdom from David. But Saul tried to be the intermediary between him and God. He tried to be the Jesus. He's not a Jesus he was a sinner. There was no way to, to remove his sin from the worship. No priest to make atonement. Maybe because he was told all his life how great he was, how good looking he was, how powerful he was. He just felt like he could do anything. And in his desperation, his fear, he really committed the worst sin he could have committed. And the Lord takes the kingdom from him. So Samuel is feeling here a mix of emotions. I imagine that the Lord rejected Saul. He was part of the search process that found him. He was an advisor for him. Saul was king because Samuel's sons were worthless. Because they did not walk in his way. So he probably feels some guilt over that, even though you can't control that. And at this time, Saul was still king, and he started acting more and more foolishly. So it was kind of an awkward time of transition. So the Lord brings Samuel out of retirement 
and gives him another assignment to go and find another king from a different family. So Samuel is now understandably fearful. And he says in verse 2, how can I go if Saul hears it, he will kill me. Remember, you're not only dealing with a fearful king who has just been told the kingdom is take, being taken from your family. You're also dealing with the possibility of committing a political crime. Saul is still the king, a political crime of treason, but God had removed his hand from Saul. So Samuel finds himself in a situation where he must decide either to obey, to disobey the law of the land or to disobey a direct command from God. Now remember, the law was that the king was the law. But God said he's not king anymore. So Samuel is forced to choose between obeying his country and obeying his Lord. And Samuel makes the right choice. He chooses the right way, even though it seems reasonable, it would cost him his life. Even when God changes his plans, he still trusts God, even though he knows he may not live past that decision. Yet God gives him more insight and instruction. He says, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. The, the official reason for him going to this family, the, the Lord loves him, gives him was to worship, which they did. But another reason that he didn't tell him right away was to anoint his son, Jesse, a son of Jesse, as king. Sometimes when God changes our plans or his plans, he's forced to change them for our good because we've gotten outside of his will. We've gotten outside of his will. So God is changing. And Romans 8, 28 says that he's always making things good for those who love God. But the problem is he's having to continue to do that because we get out of his will. We sin. So many times we trust God when he changes our plans. Maybe we've gotten out of his will, but we still trust him knowing that he is still working for our good. Still working for his glory. And we're going to see even though the people wanted a king... And even though God gave him Saul, even though God had to go through the painful process of removing the kingdom from Saul and giving it to David, David became a great king. A man after God's own heart. Even though there shouldn't have ever, have ever been a king in the first place. So we trust God when he changes our plans. Secondly, trust God when he changes your perspective. When he changes your perspective, verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? Samuel was still a well-known leader in Israel, and Bethlehem was a small town, and here's the elders of the town, the leaders, and here comes Samuel to their doorstep. It's probably, it's like when the principal would come to your classroom. It wasn't usually a good thing. It wasn't usually a good reason. So they were probably a little awestruck, but also concerned. And they asked, are you here for peace? <laughs> Is this a good visit? And he said, yes, peaceably. I, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord in your town. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. They're all, they all prepare for worship. All of Jesse's sons were present. And little do they know that, that Samuel is looking at these men trying to see who the next Saul would be. I can imagine like, one, like a police lineup, right? Where they're all lined up and he's just looking at them and he's like, well, that one's not as good looking as Saul. That one's not as strong as Saul. Oh, that one might be. I can imagine looking for a king that can motivate the people, a figurehead that also can be a warrior. Verse 6, and when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, ah, this is it. This is Eliab. He's 6'4", 230, runs the 40 in 4.3 seconds. This is the guy right here. Eli He's, he might be better than Saul. This is the guy right here, Eliab. Maybe he was the most physically imposing and the most attractive. And Samuel's excited. And the Lord said to Samuel, verse 7, 
Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Southern Baptist theologian John Hammett says this. He says that the word heart is the most important and most frequent term that the Bible uses in reference to any aspect or capacity of humans. 900 times the Bible uses the word heart. And the heart is the seat of one's personality. It is the central focus of one's life. It, it encapsulates who someone really is. So he's saying, don't look at, the God doesn't judge the outward appearance. God judges the character, the person, the man, the woman. Don't look at how people appear. Look at how people actually are. This is what's happening with the selection of the king. Now, only the Lord truly knows the heart, which is why Samuel has to trust the Lord to guide him here. The Lord is looking at the heart of these men and is directing Samuel by the Spirit to select the man who has the character to be king. Not perfection, but the character. Day in and day out, yes, he'll sin as we know. He sinned, David sinned greatly. He was a murderer and an adulterer. But somehow he still had the character to be called a man after God's own heart. He was a sinner like everyone else, but in his everyday living, everyday aspect, he had the heart that God wanted. Verse 8, Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel, and he said, nope, the Lord hasn't chosen this one. Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Verse, twin, uh, verse 10, and Jesse's made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. As Samuel was listening to the Lord to direct his heart, he was open to the Lord to direct his heart, he realized that none of these men were the new king. I don't know what it was. We don't know if there was more conversation. We don't know if there was just looking at him or him just listening to the Lord or a feeling he had, but none of them. And these are all the sons. You can think that Samuel might be confused, but he doesn't quit. He asks a question, a very obvious question. Are these all your sons? You would think possibly there's seven of them. Because the Lord hasn't told me that any of these are the man, but I know that a son of yours is coming. He said, there's still a young one, but he's out keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him. For we're not going to sit down until he comes here. In other words, we're not, we're not leaving until he's here. Jesse seemed to think that his youngest son wouldn't be considered to be a king. He was a shepherd. He was young. But the Lord looks at the heart, verse 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now it's interesting to note. That the Lord says, God doesn't look at man's appearance, but then there's a description of David here. So I, I want us to look at this. Ruddy could mean one of two things. That he had red hair, which would be unusual in the Middle East, because the people in the Middle East in the biblical times look just like they do now. I imagine. Of course, I went there years ago, but we imagine so, right? Red hair would have been different. Or he had more of a red complexion. And my granddad kind of had a red complexion to him, you know, and he could take, he could take a, a, a match and light it on his cheek, you know what I mean? You know, he was just kind of a red kind of farmer. I was my granddad, you know, so, you know, just kind of, a, kind of that type of, of look. And uh, it would have been different, you know, it would have been different. Red hair, that's odd. Red complexion, a bit unusual. Then it says he had beautiful eyes. Now, maybe he did. <laughs> But it can also be translated as he had a good countenance about him. He had a good posture about him. He was mentally sharp. He had some type of calming, 
charisma. Have you ever met a, a famous person before and you kind of walk in a room and they just kind of have this calming charisma about them? It just kind of puts you at peace, right? Or someone that is well known. I think that's a very possible interpretation. The Lord just say, just look at the outside. This beautiful eyes has this idea of this, his eyes are pretty, it, it's a reflection of his entire countenance. He had the mental personality to be a king. And then he says he was handsome, which just is quite literally a way of saying he was easy on the eyes. <laughs> quite literally, it's easy on the eyes. This is not what made him king, but this is what he looked like nonetheless. So we, we, we trust God when he changes our perspective. How many times do we see a situation out in front of us and we think, I don't know about that. That didn't look good. Or this looks great. And the Lord changes our perspective. We see things differently. We don't see things the way the world sees them. We start seeing things the way the Lord wants us to see them. But trust God when he changes your perspective. And finally, number three, Trust God when he changes your path, the path that you are on. We're all on some type of path in life right now. We are. We're all walking in a journey with Christ. Sometimes we get comfortable on our path. Amen? <laughs> sometimes we get comfortable on our path. And sometimes the Lord changes our path, and we see this. Not only in Samuel's life, but in David's life. Think about David. He's out tending the sheep. He's thinking his life is going to be one where he's the youngest of eight brothers. He's not getting any inheritance. <laughs> he's just tending the sheep. His, son, his dad says, David, come inside. He comes in. He's smelly, dirty. Been out with the sheep. Uh, with the sheep. Probably uh, chasing off lions or something like that. Nobody else wanted to do that. <laughs> Maybe he was watching a little wrestling. I don't know what he was doing there. <laughs> and he says to him, you're the next king. David didn't have a, a life goal to be king of Israel. Trust God when he changes your Half. Verse 13, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forth. As soon as he was anointed, the Holy Spirit came upon David. This is how the Spirit was in the Old Testament. In the church age, we all believers received the Spirit, but in the Old Testament, the Spirit only touched a few people who the Lord was using for his purpose. In the next verse, it tells us, we don't have it, this one, that the Spirit left Saul which was a tragic thing. And this idea of rushed, simply that God came upon David. Not only did he have the character necessary, he now had the spirit to direct him. And the spirit advanced into David's life, and the direction of David's life was changed in an instance. Sometimes, no matter what we think our plan is in life, we might just be out shepherding or doing whatever God's called us to do. And we come in one day and there's somebody in our house and our life's changed. And when that happens, that can be scary because we have everything planned out normally. I remember the day we found out Emily was pregnant with John David. I had, I had my future planned out. Yeah, my oldest child was six, seven. I wasn't looking for a baby. <laughs> I had everything planned out. I'll retire at this age. I'll do this at this age. And man, now I'm like, gosh, I'm going to have, by the time he graduates high school, I'll have been parenting for 30 years. <sighs> that was the thought, because Jackson will be 30 when he's 18. And I took about two or three days and crawled up in a corner and, Rethought about my life. But now I love my life, amen. It's a blessing. And many times God changes your path. 
We need to trust him when he does that. No matter how scary it might be, no matter how unprepared we think that might be. There's an old story of a man who fell off a cliff. You may have heard this. He was going to die, and he's falling down the cliff, and, and, he, and he throws out a hand, and he miraculously catches a branch on the cliff. And he's hanging there. And he says, is anyone up there on the top of the cliff? And the voice answered, yes. The man said, who are you? And the voice said, I'm God, and I'm going to save you. He says, great. God, what do I do? God said, let go of the branch. And the man's holding the branch, and he says, is anybody else up there? <laughs> Sometimes the Lord wants us to let go of the branch. Amen. He says, I'm up here. Things are changing maybe in your life. Just let go of the branch and trust me to catch you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, Lord, and what you've done for us today. And as we close our time together today, Lord, that we would trust you no matter what in our life, Father, whether you change our, our path and our plans and our perspectives, that we would understand that we always can put our trust in you, that you'll never fail us, you'll never injure us. you always be there for us, Lord. And we thank you so much for Jesus, that through his death and his burial and his resurrection, that because of what he's done, we can trust you. That you hold us in the palm of your hands, Father. Lord, we love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.